the lecture. You should see some sort of handwritten notes there. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah, we find the students sometimes uh, fall asleep. They see too many very nice PowerPoint slides with everything pretty and things. Sometimes if it's uh, handwriting, especially bad handwriting like mine, uh, students tend to stay awake because they can't to <laughs> concentrate and work out what the words say. But hopefully these aren't so bad. Uh, I think most of my presentations are in proper PowerPoint. There's just one or two that are like this. OK, we're still doing the basics and uh, some of this will be familiar. Some of this won't be familiar. Uh, who's heard of the How Triangle before? Looks like nobody. OK, no. that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, macromolecular size and uh, shape. Now we're going to talk about the different types of macromolecule and the range of sizes, uh, how you represent shape, and this nice concept called the How Triangle, which is doesn't mean that macromolecules have a triangle shape. It's a nice way of representing the shape of a macromolecule between the three extremes of conformation, which are sphere, uh, coil, and rod. So the how triangle is a way of representing conformations of molecules between those three extremes. And then we'll talk about the size shapes of proteins. We've already mentioned polysaccharides, but size and shapes of proteins. And then ways of representing the shapes in uh, in solution. We're not talking about crystallographic structures, and that's all RASMOL, that, that, that will come later. It's the overall shapes, flexibility of molecules that we're dealing with here, which are, in terms of the properties and solution, are more important than the individual positions of amino acids and all this sort of stuff. So. We'll get some training in this. Right, folks, so types of macromolecule. Again, this repeats partly what we've just done before the break and the ranges of sizes. So, right, protein, molecular weights between, well, 1,000, but usually 2,000 and 5 million. We get some very large protein molecules, like in muscle. Uh, there is this very large protein called titin. <laughs> titin means big, and that can have a molecular weight of 5 million daltons, or molar mass of five million uh, grams per mole. Uh, polysaccharides can go even higher. Uh, we met a myelopectin. We all know what myelopectin now is, don't we, folks? Uh, so when we have starch next to rice, we'll think of, oh, yeah, a myelopectin. Oh, yeah, that's got a big molecular weight than it has. It's a huge molecular weight. It can be as high as 50 million Daltons or 50 million grams uh, per mole. Then we have uh, glycoproteins, proteoglycans. Again, they can have a similar molecular weight uh, range. You can have uh, uh, a small uh, glycan uh, antibiotic like vancomycin that has a molecular weight of, I think, about 1500. Uh, that's, yeah, you regard that as a glycoprotein just at the bottom end of the scale that has protein and some carbohydrate. And then the very large tissue proteoglycan complexes of 50 million molecular weight, 
or thereabouts. And some of the mucin glycoproteins and mucus can go up to that size as well. And then uh, nucleic acids, they can have huge molecular weights. So they'll compact it into uh, chromosomes or other uh, structures, mitochondria, uh, etc. And I think we just said before that many proteins are glycoproteins. They can have uh, some carbohydrate attached, like albumin or antibodies, just a few percent. And uh, project glycans come from uh, connective, uh, connective tissue in the, the body. Right, in terms of uh, shapes of molecules, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, you can get globular shapes. Oops. Globular shapes, uh, rods, ellipsoids, asymmetric structures, antibodies can be like Y or T-shaped molecules, and also uh, coil-like uh, molecules as well. And it's important to realize that in representing uh, conformations, uh, many macromolecules have to revise this slide, I'm afraid, uh, guys, uh, of importance to the food and pharmaceutical industries and also the environment. I think we should add that. Uh, so many macromolecules of importance uh, in food, pharmaceutical or in the environment uh, cannot be analysed by X-ray crystallography uh, unless they are well-defined molecules like, like proteins. The vast majority can't be analysed by X-ray crystallography. Uh, and sometimes they are also too large to be analysed by other techniques like NMR, which can also give detailed high resolution structures. But uh, we can still represent the overall or gross, that means overall conformation, uh, which are usually adequate to describe the solution properties. And uh, this representation called the, the How Triangle developed at Trondheim is very useful in this context. So what we do uh, is we place the three extremes of conformation, which are compact sphere, rigid rod, and completely random coil at the corners of this hypothetical triangle. And the idea is that the conformation of a given molecule is somewhere between these extremes. So the overall conformation, say, of a protein molecule is usually between that of a compact sphere and a rod-shaped structure, depending on the aspect ratio of the molecule. For example, hemoglobin has a compact near spherical shape, whereas Myosin, which is a rod-like protein which you find in muscle, is very elongated. Okay, so this caters usually for a wide range of protein shapes between compact sphere and rod. That's this side of the triangle. This side of the triangle is usually used for representing conformations of polysaccharides and nucleic acids, glycoproteins, or very heavily glycosylated glycoproteins, which usually have conformation to that of a rod and a coil. And then uh, denatured proteins can have conformation between a sphere and a coily type of molecule. That's described by this side of a triangle. So the conformation of a macromolecule in reality is between these extremes. And for a given molecule, it can be represented by a locus. Uh, what's locus? It means a point, 
a point. Yeah, not a low cost. Low cost is something else. That low cost is an insect, so it's not that low. <laughs> yeah. In coursework and examinations, I sometimes get people writing answers with uh, locusts in them. Uh, this is nothing to do with locusts. It's uh, locusts. So the confirmation of a given macromolecule can be represented by a locus or point along the sides of a triangle. So it's a very convenient way of representing the extremes of confirmation. What are we done? Polysaccharides. This is just a comparable table for uh, proteins, and this compares the sizes and shapes of protein molecules. You can get globular molecules like ovalbumin, which comes from eggs. Eggs. You mentioned that it's a glycoprotein. Actually, it's got a small amount of sugar on it. Antibodies can have irregular or asymmetric shapes like uh, Y shapes or T shapes. And uh, so uh, antibodies are an example of irregular shape molecules. You can have uh, rod shapes like uh, myosin from muscle. That's actually a dimer. So these are myosin dimers, which form dimers, flexible rod shaped dimers um, with a bit of a symmetry at the end. These are the S1 heads of the uh, myosin molecule. You get multi subunit proteins like the uh, C globulins, like some of the enzyme complexes like pyruvate dehydrogenase. 11S soybean. Globulin. What does S stand for in soybean globulin? Um, uh, sedimentation. Yeah, absolutely. It refers to the sedimentation yeah. coefficient in Spedberg units. So 11S Spedberg. It's like in nucleic acids, 70S ribosomes, 30S ribosomes, mm -hmm. or the S describes the sedimentation coefficient. It's a measure of this, another measure like molecular weight of the size of molecules. Yeah. Then you can get denatured proteins, have flexible coils. OK, that's so the, the proteins you get can get a range, but not quite as diverse as polysaccharides. And these are some of the molecular weights. Well, 100 or 150, perhaps if it's got an aromatic side chain. The amino acid 150 Daltons or 150 grams per mole. Peptide hormones in 2000 and 8000. Uh, Ovalbumin's got a molecular weight of 45,000. Antibodies about 160,000. And then we can go right up to these large molecules like titan, 2 million. And that can also associate into larger structures, which are greater than 5. Uh, Five million. That gives you an idea of the ranges of sizes of proteins and compared to an amino acid uh, molecule. All right, folks, that's the shapes and sizes of protein molecules. And don't forget, the sizes of particular proteins are exact because they're coded by a gene. Uh, so it'll be a precise number of Daltons, 44,164 or whatever, depending on the molecule and the species it comes from. So generally proteins are very precise in the uh, molecular weight. I'm going to finish off with just ways of representing the shapes of uh, molecules. I mean, these pan drawn shapes are not brilliant, but I'll point you in the direction of a scientific paper which relates to all this at the uh, end 
of the lecture when I finish these uh, slides. So, you know, foodie macromolecules, which are very flexible, ellipsoid modeling is not suitable, but ellipsoid modeling is very suitable for representing the shapes of globular protein molecules, to give an idea of how extended a globular protein is. So we use these ellipsoids, which are three dimensional ellipse. Right, you know, you have a circle. And if you compress the circle, you end up with a elliptical type of structure. So you're all familiar with an ellipse, like a, a flattened circle. Or well, an ellipsoid is like a three dimensional ellipse. So whereas a sphere, is a three-dimensional circle, an ellipsoid is a three-dimensional ellipse. And uh, for protein shape representation, we use two types of ellipsoid. Uh, one is called a prolate ellipsoid, and it has one long axis, A, and two equal shorter axes. It's a one long axis A and two shorter axes. So a prolate ellipsoid. It's rather like a uh, American football or rugby ball. Uh, so a prolate ellipsoid is like, a, or maybe a cigar. <laughs> Maybe no one smokes cigars these days because of uh, health reasons, but in Cuba, they used to make these big Havana cigars that were basically uh, prolate ellipsoids. So a prolate ellipsoid is a cigar shaped or rugby or American football type of molecule with one long axis and two short axes. And most Globular proteins <laughs> represented by this simple shape to describe how elongated they are. And we represent the elongation by what's called the axial ratio, A over B. So it's the ratio of the long axis to the two equal short axes, so A over B. And this represents how asymmetric the protein molecule is. So uh, myosin has a very long rod-shaped molecule. So it has a axial ratio of about 80, a very high axial ratio. Was hemoglobin, a very compact globular molecule, almost spherical, so it has an axial ratio of 1. So the lowest value you can get for this axial ratio is one, which corresponds to a sphere. Like this, A is always the long axis and B is always the short axis. So A over B, it's a very easy way of representing the molecular shape. And you can measure uh, this quite easily using techniques like Viscosity. It's a very simple way of measuring shapes of molecules. But that doesn't apply to all proteins. We've already heard about antibodies being asymmetric. But there are also other proteins which can be better represented with another type of ellipsoid, uh, which has uh, two long axes and one. Short axis. And this shape this has let's do this a, di a different color, a different color. Right. 
up to this shape. As to the server. Yeah. Two long axes. And one short axis. So prolate ellipsoid, okay, here has one long axis and two short axes. This is called an oblate ellipsoid. Okay, you all see that? Yeah, so yeah. two long axes and one short axis. Now, has anybody ever had any of these? Okay, can you see that, folks? Yeah, so candy. Smarties. Uh, also, minstrels have uh, are quite good. So if I, oops. Disaster. Okay, can you all see those uh, Smarties in my hand? It's out of camera. Uh, yeah, 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 I can see. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. All right. These are oblate ellipsoids. Okay. Right. So these are disc shaped disc shapes. And uh, there we are. <laughs> Not eat that one. It's quite nice. Uh, so oblate ellipsoids. This is where you missed out. This has been a face to face class. <laughs> I could have showed out all these uh, uh, smarties, but M and M's are more impressive. They're a little bit not M and M's. Uh, minstrels. That's right, minstrels. Uh, anyone ever had the sweet min the minstrels? The little chocolate, little chocolate. Uh, yeah. Tops. So they're uh, oblate ellipsoids. So some proteins are better represented by uh, ellipsoid uh, shapes, and an example is the. Uh, what's called the FC fragment of an antibody. Okay, so you've got a very crude antibody shape here. So there's the uh, end region and then you've got these are the fab regions with antibody molecule and this is the FC region. So the FC region is better modeled by an oblate ellipsoid and the fab regions are better modeled by uh, the equal in size, actually, by uh, early ellipsoids. Okay. So that's an example of uh, oblate. But generally speaking, the prolate is usually a better description of the uh, molecular shape for, for most protein. Uh, molecules. Uh, one exception uh, is antibodies, really, because you can't represent the overall shape of the antibody molecule by an ellipsoid. Instead, we use something called uh, B modeling. Again, uh, we'll go to the scientific paper in a second and you, you can see these uh, uh, what these molecules are like. But B modeling is used to represent uh, complex shape protein molecules. Uh, and the idea is that you let's move this out of the way. You can Basically, this is also very good for looking at uh, uh, 
multi subunit uh, protein uh, molecules. And the idea is you create a model for your structure uh, in terms of an array of beads like this, or like that, or like that. Uh, and then you can calculate uh, what's called a hydrodynamic parameter. This is a parameter which describes the properties of a molecule. And RG is a parameter called the, the radius of gyration, which we can get from scattering properties. S or S20W is the sedimentation coefficient, which you can get from sedimentation properties of the molecule. And this thing here, square brackets with this Greek letter, eta, or eta, Greek letter, is a parameter which represents the viscosity of a molecule. So this radius of duration from scattering, the sedimentation coefficient from centrifugation, and this uh, parameter called the intrinsic viscosity, from viscosity measurements. You can calculate, you create a structure that you can calculate what the value of that structure should be for a given model. And then you compare what the value you predict for that parameter is from your constructed model with what you actually measure from experiment. So you measure your radius of gyration from uh, an X-ray scattering experiment uh, so you 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 you, you uh, calculate what that value is for a given model. Then you measure it using your X-ray scattering device, and then you see how well your model fits, or the predicted value from your model fits the actual measured value. And then you just select the best model which agrees with the data, or you just iterate or change the model until you forget, until you get a, 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 a agreement. So an example is for this protein called a beta lactoglobulin. Now, a beta lactoglobulin is a protein which comes from, anyone know where lactoglobulin comes from? So albumin comes from eggs, lactoglobulin comes from lacto? Milk. Milk, yeah. It's a milk protein, beta lactoglobulin. Now beta lactoglobulin in its normal state uh, exists as dimers, that's two subunits coming together. But in some cases, they can form octamers. That means eight units come together to give a larger structure. And we want to know whether these eight units come together like that in the chain, or a set of four on top of each other, a planar type of structure, or as a globular blob where the four or the eight molecules come together into a compact array. And using special programs, you can calculate what these structures will give. So that linear structure will give a radius of gyration we get from X-ray scattering measurements of 8.1 nanometers. This planar structure gives a value of 4.7 nanometers. And this compact structure gives a value of 3.9 nanometers. The experimental value for the radius of duration 
turn out to be 3.4 nanometers. So we choose which of these models closest, it fits closest this value, and it turns out to be this compact model three is the most likely. That's an example of model fitting. You create a model or certain models, you predict what their properties are going to be, you measure or compare it with the measured property, and then you select the model which best fits the experimental uh, data. Uh, and that method has been used very powerfully for representing the shapes of uh, complex uh, molecules. And on the Moodle, I forget when you eventually get on Moodle, <laughs> yeah. hopefully uh, very uh, soon. Uh, I'll just stop sharing that screen. Uh, let me see if I can get paper. Uh, let's go to biophysical. Hmm, here we are. Biophysical reviews paper. Right. If I just share that, uh, let's go to. Right, let's show that screen. Here we are. Okay, folks, so if you if you go to this paper, you don't have to study it, you don't have to ask any answer any questions on it. Just for you to look at uh, to see types of structures that are involved. these are all the complex formula which are used to predict what the shapes of the, the molecules are but there we go that's an ellipsoid uh, a product ellipsoid representation for the confirmation of Oh, right. So A is the tetanus toxoid protein used in like conjugate vaccines, and that has uh, an actual ratio of three to one. That's a product lipsoid actual ratio three to uh, one. These are Proteins, these are wheat protein glidins, okay? And they have a range of shapes depending on what type of glidin they are, from nine to as high as 34. These uh, wheat protein glidins represented by prolate ellipsoids. Uh, Right, these are B models of some complex structures. And even more complex structures there. There's a, a B model of uh, an antibody molecule. This is uh, IgG3. This is the FC region. See, that looks like a oblate lipsoid. And the beads on the surface of these prolate ellipsoids for the fab regions, and this is the uh, the hinge uh, region. Okay, so you can look at that. I've given you that uh, uh, reference in the Moodle, just to see the differences in shapes of molecules you can you can get, uh, and how we can predict them. Uh, don't worry at all about all these equations and things that's uh, that doesn't concern you at all just the, the diagrams really okay guys so we'll stop there uh, we're a bit ahead of time but we've we've covered what uh, i wanted to 
do uh, today. Are there any questions on that? Probably won't be because uh, you know, this is all new stuff, so you'll need time to sort of uh, uh, go away, look at the lecture notes, and maybe replay the uh, the lecture and uh, see how we we get on. Uh, but I will show you this, which I'm sure will get you thinking. Let me close screen and share screen again. Uh, let's see where we are. Go up here. By all three thousand and two, there we are. Come on. Right. So let's share screen again. Okay. Uh, window. Right. Just to show you what you're up against, don't get too frightened by this. Because <laughs> right. over the weeks we'll work through the course and then you'll learn how to uh, do the various tasks. So there's 10 questions and an essay. That's all that's involved. There's no examination. That's all it is. And what I suggest you do is that you do do it bit by bit. So after today, you should be able to do question one based on the uh, free energy stuff, which we talked about uh, before the break. So you should be able to attempt question one. The only thing to watch out for are the units. That's kilojoules here. And that's joules. So you need to either work in kilojoules consistently throughout or joules consistently throughout. Just, just be aware of that. That is the enthalpy change in immunotherapy protein uh, in unfolding. Uh, so you've got to, yeah, that's easy. A, B, uh, working out the Free energy of unfolding, that's in our 8K. And C, the question, would unfolding happen at this temperature or would immunotherapy protein X remain folded? So that depends on whether the free energy change is negative or positive. Should be important there. But, and if you make a mess of the conversions here, you'll get the wrong answer. So that's a question you can do this week. And the others we can think about as we go along, but don't be too frightened by that lot. When we do the lectures, you'll see how, I would say straightforward, but you see how they can be they can be sorted. So there's a, a mixture of calculations and a mixture of observation, and there's an essay at the at the end. Okay. And do all that, you end up passing the module. It's simple as that. Right, guys, so thank you for your attention uh, this week. I hope it didn't seem too difficult. Some easy stuff there, uh, some new stuff like how triangle ellipsoid shapes, axial ratios, smarties, <laughs> minstrels. Yeah, I've got to go, got to go across now to the uh, the shop on campus here, see if they've got any minstrels. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll see you again next next Thursday. Uh -huh. Thank you.
Are you okay with this online, or would you prefer? Can we now to Southern Bonington, guys, for a face to face? Is both are fine for me, though. Well, yeah, both are fine. Yeah. Sorry. Both yeah, are fine. fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Zizang, any any strong preference? Yeah, I'm or? I'm okay with either. So. Okay. Well, we will get you down here uh, soon. Uh, one way, and also the thicker if other PhD students join us as well, uh, then uh, we can. But it will be down here at Southern Bington, not at the main campus, guys. We'll need to catch the bus. Okay. Right, see you soon, folks, and uh, good luck with the, Thank the quarantine you. finishing. Let's see yeah. if the result goes negative. Yeah. We'll say hello yeah. when you have a word with Glab about the about the, the movie. Yeah. yeah, even I'll, I'll be meeting him. Okay. Right, see you folks. Cool. Thank you. See you next week. Good day. Thank you. Right, thank you.